Today we honored Edward Stevenson and his families. Part 3, from 1839 to 1844. The first log house was built in commerce, now Nauvoo, by Theodore Turley, June 11, 1839, not far from the Prophet Joseph's. I have visited it in early times, and for those times it was pretty good. The Prophet said of commerce that when he moved there, there was only one stone and three log houses, including the one he lived in. The place was literally a swampy wilderness, trees, bushes, and bogs with snails covering the bottomlands. The location with its bluffs, or bench land, in a large bend of the river looked majestic. I attended a meeting September 2, 1839, where the Prophet Joseph directed a stake of Zion be located and called Zarahemla. He preached from a wagon under some trees, and he referred to Revelation, 14th chapter, making a correction. They shall continue their work, 13th verse, not, and their works do follow them. The prophet said he loved to swim in deep water, for he had been preaching some deep things, and we had a feast of fat things, for he spoke with great power. I heard him also make another correction, Hebrews 6 chapter, first verse, not leaving the principles, etc. It reads in its present, therefore leaving the principles. He said we would require faith towards God, repentance, baptisms, plural, etc., for the living and the dead. Baptisms would be required, as we understand, for the living. Rebaptism for the dead is indispensable. The prophet seemed full of good instruction, as if he would not always be with us, and as he said, we would not all of us remember his saying. It was not long after this when the prophet in Iowa said in vision he saw the valleys of Utah and told some present, Anson Call was one of them, that they should yet go to the valleys of the Rocky Mountains and drink of the cold rivulets running clear as crystal streams. But, said the prophet, before that day some of us smiting his breast will be martyred. Our blood will be shed. Many others will lay down by the wayside as martyrs worn out, and a great many will apostatize. But some of you will yet go beyond the Rocky Mountains and see this people become a great people. I have never heard or seen a man so filled with inspiration, and many of his words are so deeply impressed upon my mind that I shall pen some of them. Nauvoo and Iowa, for I have heard him in both places. I will prophesy that the signs of the coming of Christ is in fulfillment of the scriptures and are already commenced. Pestilence and desolation will follow closely one after the other. We shall hear of war and bloodshed. I testify of these things and that the coming of the Son of Man is nigh even at your doors. If we are not looking for these things, we shall be numbered with those who will call for rocks to fall upon us, etc. Elijah the prophet will turn the hearts of the children to their fathers and the fathers to the children, whether living or dead, which will prepare them for the coming of the Son of Man. If Elijah did not come, the whole earth would be smitten. There will be but little peace from henceforth for the world or saints. Although some cry peace, peace, yet war and commotion will exist. But the saints will have stakes of Zion as a place of refuge, and the time will come when he who will not take up his sword against his neighbor will flee to Zion for safety. These things are coming, and I testify of them, for surely they must come to pass. But those who have the spirit of Zion and gather out from Babylon with a spirit to build Zion will have joy and peace. For there is no peace to the wicked, neither is there rest for faithful saints. But bear in mind, there is a time coming when there will be both peace and rest for faithful saints. But it will not be of long duration until the Ancient of Days shall come. Then judgment will be given to the saints. 
These were days to me of great treasures, and I esteemed them as apples of gold and pitchers of silver. Although sickness prevailed and death, with pinching times for the poor, and all were poor together, yet we had a prophet of God to lead us, and to teach us not by man's wisdom, but by the revelations of Jesus Christ. While on this subject of the prophet's sayings, I must conclude with some choice words of his on the subject of the priesthood. It was the grandest of instructions in that day and age of the world. The prophet said the priesthood is an everlasting principle and existed with God from eternity. It was first given to Adam as pertaining to this earth. He obtained the first presidency and held the keys of it from generation to generation. He obtained it in the creation before the world was formed. Joseph Smith was the first whom I ever heard proclaim a plurality of gods. He said that there was Elohim God and Jehovah God and Michael God, and there were gods many and also many lords, a god to every earth as well as a savior to redeem them. But to us and pertaining to this earth and its redemption, there was to us but one true and living God. I began to believe that the prophet possessed an infinity of knowledge, his resources with the Urim and Thummim filled with revelation and inspiration. Also the pearl of great price gave him advantages to bring the heavenly worlds to view. I looked upon him as upon no other man, and I learned to love that great man of God. September 22, 1839. I had nearly recovered my health, but was very weakly, and had not been able to do but very little work since July, 1839. Everything looked rather dark for a living, and not only for our family, but nearly all who had been driven from the state of Missouri. There appeared a little hope for our receiving some aid from the rent of our farm, which was as yet in an unsettled condition. Hence about four years' rent coming to us. Therefore, I began to make preparations to make my way back to Pontiac, Oakland County, Michigan. Having been so highly blessed and favored with the presence and of hearing so great a prophet as this inspired man, Joseph Smith, I felt all the better prepared for a long and tedious journey which lay before me in the month of October, 1839. The worst of all was to start on a journey with neither purse or money, but something desperate must be done, for very little work for money was to be had, and nearly all of the community were the same, all poor alike and for all of us had been driven from our homes and property, and although we could create plenty of work building up homes, but the money was not to pay for the work. Now the object I had in view was we had an estate yet unsold in Michigan Territory, but it was rented by a friend whom we had left in charge of the homestead, and it was quite probable after the lapse of several years that a nice little amount had by this time accumulated and we never again should need it more than at the present crisis. It was down the Mississippi River to St. Louis, Missouri, which route I had selected. From there, the conjunction of the Missouri River to the mouth of the Ohio River, where I should then take a steamboat up the Ohio River via Louisville and Cincinnati, where I should meet my two brothers and visit them, and perhaps spend part of the winter and then proceed on my journey overland to Michigan to our old homestead. Delighted with the prospect which lay before me, with expectations of receiving the needed rents due us, I set myself about the best plan to accomplish the desired object but could find no way of obtaining money to accomplish the journey. Hence it required all the more courage to start. Finally, my first effort was to see some captains of the many steamboats running down the river, and my idea proved good, for I succeeded in finding a captain who gave me the berth of a cabin boy with a free passage to St. Louis, Missouri. 
who took me to the pantry and cabin of a fine steamboat, showed me my work which was suited to my condition. He said, you will not have much to do until we take up passengers on our way down the river. There was plenty to eat of the first quality and every convenience for comfort, and I felt thankful for so good an opening for me. So I bid all who were the nearest to me in this life a goodbye, and steamed away from my home and friends. We soon were gliding down over the rapids to Keokuk, 12 miles. These rapids are rather dangerous, and special pilots take charge and pilot the boats over these rapids. We passed Warsaw, Quincy, Hannibal, and many other towns on the banks of the lovely river and pretty country, arriving safely at St. Louis, Missouri. The Lord truly gave me friends, for on my arrival at St. Louis, my good friendly captain said, You have done well your duty, and here is four dollars which will aid you on your way, which I freely give you as wages well earned. My heart was filled with gratitude for such marked kindness. I felt encouraged by this unexpected act and was willing to accept it as a blessing from the Lord, feeling at the same time to ask God to bless that man. I soon engaged a deck passage down the Mississippi and then up the Ohio River to Cincinnati, Ohio. The water in the Ohio River was very low, more so than for many previous years. Therefore, our passage was a protracted one. On the Flint Island bar, there was only 18 inches of water. Other bars were also exceedingly low. In some instances, barges were sunken, then braced up in the sunken condition after which the barges were baled dry, thus lightening up the steamboat considerably after which a hawser was fastened to a tree or stump and capsuled her over those shallow bars. Several sailors working the capsid fairly dragged the boat over the bars of sand, only a short distance, however. Thus we worried our way on, passing Louisville, Kentucky, to Cincinnati, Ohio. Soon after my arrival, I found my two brothers, Joseph and Henry, both single and boarding out. We were glad to meet but I could feel a sort of estrangement between us, and on no other account only Mormonism was so unpopular among the masses of people. And this served to make both myself and them too very uncomfortable, destroying my happiness only for a short visit. It was now near Christmas, myself poorly clad, with winter and a long journey which lay before me and going on into a much colder country in Michigan. I must confess things looked rather blue for me to face, and I felt too proud to remain long on my brother's condition, feelings, and circumstances. Now came up a new feature, a temptation to renounce my religion, and either take the farm I was going to collect rent from in Michigan, for my brothers offered if I would go back take my mother and the three younger children, all of them, and make my home there, they would relinquish their interest and claims on the homestead farm in my favor. The second proposition was for me to live in Cincinnati and go into some business, they offering to help me do so, and I would soon form new acquaintances and be happy with them. For they thought, and to them it looked so, that we had had enough of Mormonism, being driven, robbed, and mobbed from our homes, and Mormonism broken up. But I could not see it in this light, hard and bad as it looked to us all. My soul, body, and my sacred honor were welded, rooted, and grounded in the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I could see no future happiness, peace of mind, joy, salvation, and exaltation in looking back after taking hold of the plow, as it were, to look back. I felt to thank God for giving me grace as my day, so as to withstand any influences brought to bear against my fixed purposes to see the end of Mormonism. 
Now I will excuse my very good moral brothers, for they, like Paul, could only see one side, which looked dark enough. Therefore they meant well in their offers and advice unto me. Finally, I accepted a job of work in a tin shop, with no other view than to pass away some of the dreary winter months when I would resume my journey. Soon after my engagement in the business, I went out to put up a stove which had been purchased from the shop. While engaged in putting up the stove, I found that I was in a house of shame and infamy, and so bold were the inmates that in almost a nude state they presented themselves, so much to my disgust that before completing the job, I left them to themselves to do as best they could with the stove. This was my first introduction to such a place, and I hope it may be the last. Whatever my boss heard about the matter, I know not. Only I know that I heard nothing about it. But it made a lasting impression on my mind. Sometime later in December, my elder brother took a large quantity of vegetables and a variety of provisions in boats down the Ohio River and thence down the Mississippi River to New Orleans, as he could see money in the operation, while my next elder brother Henry left the city going to Lawrenceburg, Indiana, to ply his business as a cooper. I was finally left alone, and I took it into my head to also leave Cincinnati. The 20th of December, 1839. I settled up on my affairs and my comrades, tenors, finding I was determined to undertake so hazardous a winter journey and on foot and alone, that they very kindly made up a little addition to my limited purse. Thanking them for their kindness and thoughtfulness, I started out with my bundle on my back in good spirits, walking up the Troy Canal 20 miles the first day. Tired, I found lodging on the following day. I got over 30 miles of my journey, and just before Christmas I arrived at Troy, Ohio, 100 miles, lamed in my great toe joint. I was unable to proceed further. I prayed and wept bitterly. Never, no never, shall I forget this scene, for it was a bitter pill for me to endure so far away from home in winter and among strangers. But a spring of joy came up before me as if I heard a voice whispering, My son, all shall be well with thee. Encouraged by this soft, still, but small voice, I offered my services as a hired man. My first offer was 25 cents a cord for cutting, splitting, and cording wood and board myself. I had not yet fully recovered from my summer sickness, and I knew this would not answer. I told the people present I was unable to pursue my journey, had very little money, and was willing to work for what I was able to earn, if only a little more than my board. A Mr. Matthew Culberson, a hatter by trade, and carrying on business in the town, believed what I said to be true, and took me home to his house. It was Saturday evening. After supper, I did up the chores in good order, which pleased him and the family. They were very comfortably situated in the house and surroundings. Sunday, they had prayers and invited me to go to meeting. They were Methodists. I told them that my father lived and died a good Methodist and was an honest man in his religious views and otherwise that he had made and played on a bass vial in the Methodist Church and gave it to the church in Detroit, Michigan on his way from Albany, New York to Pontiac where he died. I went to meetings and on Monday I worked hard and for five days. I had told him to give me what I earned and I would leave it entirely to him what the amount should be and I would quit work at his pleasure. He said nothing could be fairer, but said he, There are so many who impose upon humanity that we scarcely know whom to trust. I had done some threshing with a flail, some milling, sawed wood, and other work for five days, and notified him of my intention to leave as my lameness was healed, or nearly so. 
He wished me to remain a few days longer, but my mission was complete in this place. He placed $2.50 near my plate at breakfast, and I received some presents from his daughters and family, with his blessing on my journey, saying, You have done well, and I am glad I took you in. If ever you come this way, be sure you call on us. God heard my prayers, and my way has been opened up, and will be, I fear not, as long as the Lord cares for me. I pursued my journey through snow, but my journey through Manly Swamp was the most hazardous, as there had been a heavy snow, and only part of the way through the swamp was the road cut through the dense timber, and the other part was blazed trees, and about twenty miles through the swamp but there was barely one footman who had preceded me. This then was to be my guide. If he went astray, I would be likely to follow in his tracks. The snow was about 10 inches deep. This was my first day in the new year, 1840. Cold and frosty was the night. Oh, how thankful was I for a comfortable New Year's supper with kind friends and a blessed good home. I continued on my journey with very good success without anything unusual taking place. One little incident occurred at an inn which is worth notice, for it is so much out of the ordinary way of treatment of travelers in the present generation of seeking all one can obtain. I called at an inn with a broad sign hung out on a pole and met an aged lady who after staring at me for some time said, Yes, my little man, just put down that big bundle. You certainly can stop here. But where are you going in this cold, wintry weather? You look so young and small to be going through the world all alone. Tell me all about it, for I am anxious to hear your story. Sit down here. I related the cause of undertaking my journey with hopes of obtaining some money to aid my widowed mother and family. I found that my landlady believed what I had said to be true. I had a good rest, bed, and sleep, and fully prepared for my journey the next morning. When I went to settle my bill, this good old lady put in my hand a handful of small change. I do not remember how much. But she said, this is your bill with a little advice. It will help you on your journey. Hold up your head, be honest, keep a stiff upper lip, and a lower one to match it, and you shall get through this life. Be happy and prosper. Goodbye, my little man, and God bless you on your way, and a safe return to your widowed mother. I could scarcely refrain from weeping before this good, honest mother of a woman, for her advice and kind words reached my heart and so deeply impressed my mind that it still is impressed indelibly never, I dare say, to be eradicated. Indeed, a kind word turns away wrath. Nothing of importance occurred only to tramp snow and face some winter storms until day by day I shortened my journey and finally after a tedious and wintry journey I reached our old homestead, the land of my youthful days. I found many changes among the people and country Yet some of my companion friends and old neighbors were pleased to meet me, asking many questions about Mormonism and our new country. Time soon passed away, spring approaching, and my visit to the old fishing resorts and hunting grounds and the very lake where I was baptized and the schoolhouse where I used to go to school and meetings and where I attended the first Mormon meeting also where I first saw Joseph Smith. Looking over some of these old scenes opened up a field of thought, food for reflection in time to come. Near there was the grave of my father, and nearby was where my mother was baptized. Some of the old neighbors had died, others moved away, and there was our old homestead, which I might enjoy if I would. Once before I had left it for the gospel, and my love for the gospel had not in the least degree lost its brightness and luster, but it had grown brighter and more dear to me, 
And although I could get only $8 from Mr. Joshua Terry on three years' rent, I soon turned my back on the old home and friends and set my face Zionward, a distance of over 400 miles on foot, again through Michigan, Indiana, and Illinois, very cold and snowy weather. By the time I arrived at the Illinois River, boats were running, and from Ottawa I rode down to Beardstown on the river and then footed it through to Nauvoo and crossed over the Mississippi River into Iowa where I found my mother, two sisters, and a younger brother. Mother and sisters were working out and my brother living at Sister Wright's. Scattered as they were, no home or land, Many others were equally as bad or worse off than we were, for I had youth on my side, health and strength and a will, and with all the blessings of a good mother to stimulate me. And thank God, a husband to the widow, father to the fatherless, whose promises are to help in time of need. Again, we had left houses and lands, homes and friends for the gospel's sake and had been driven from our homes into exile and poverty. Painted mobs enraged and led on to acts of violence by ministers who know better, and I speak advisably, for I personally saw and know of many of them, two particularly, Captain Bogart and Cook, his son-in-law, Methodist, both of them preachers, both of those were leaders of mobs, Bogart asked me questions at the time when we were prisoners in Far West. These ministers and others were pillaging the town and annoying widows, orphans, and defenseless women. While we were as prisoners in the hands of those vile wretches, ministers and others led on by them. And I desire these lines may be read by my children and children's children for generations to come that they may know the true cause of our present poverty and my long and tedious journey just performed, and that, too, without the real merit which honestly belongs to us as rents of a farm for three years, only the paltry sum of eight dollars. In our robbed, forlorn condition, cast out as not, I say unto my children and children's children and all good saints, Let their prayers ascend in connection with those who John the Revelator saw under the altar who had been slain for the witness and testimony of Jesus. Then let our prayers with them call upon God until the blood of all the martyrs of ancient and modern times shall by God's justice be satisfied. For we must understand mercy shall not rob justice neither justice rob mercy. Having thus explained the cause of our present condition, I looked around to see what would be the best we could do to make a living and home. Nauvoo was headquarters, land, deer, and a very sickly place, rather a hard place for poor people to get a start, while in Iowa, territory land was cheap, plenty of room to spread out. After my journey, I had money enough left to buy an axe and a hoe in which I invested and then began looking for a suitable place to use them. After searching around, I laid claim to 40 acres of land, but without team and tools, it was not wise to undertake that new piece of land at present, but used it to good account subsequently by exchanging it in part for another more suitable piece. I finally, for the time being, worked during the first season with Father Clark's family. I farming with them and shared some of the crops while my mother worked in the family. The settlement afforded a place of meetings, schools, etc. Many good meetings we enjoyed with spelling schools in the evenings. Candy pullings was an amusement often indulged in for a pastime. In the fall of 1840, I exchanged my 40 acres for a piece of land more near the settlement, paying more for it as fast as I could earn it. I soon built a log house for a home for my mother's family, and once more we had a roof of our own to rest under its shade. Humble as it was, 
we had learned how to appreciate it by contrast. In those early days of poverty, we built cheap houses. The logs were notched one upon another, chinking the cracks and plastering them tightly. The roof was shingled with clapboards or long shingles three feet in length placed on siege poles. Then instead of nailing them, a weight pole was laid on the shingles to hold them in place. Two short knees or pieces were placed against the weight pole, and then another pole was laid on the clapboards resting against the knees to keep the poles apart and to hold the long shingles in place, making a pretty tight roof so that it answered the purpose pretty well. Well, now for the chimney. Slicks were split out resembling lath, only not so long. These were placed something like little boys used to build cob houses. Mud is mixed with sometimes a little short straw and plastered over those laugh sticks, making the chimney the usual height. And as to the floor, poles for joists were placed about three to four feet apart, being hewn on top so as to level them after being in place. Then what was called puncheon was placed on them being hewn from pieces of soft wood called basswood. They were split out of basswood logs and five feet long and would be from eight to twelve inches wide. And when nicely hewn were white, the edges being straightened made our floors, and for those days we felt proud of them. This then was the style of our domicile. During the winter of 1841, I chopped trees into lengths of 10 feet, splitting them into fence rails. They required to be about four inches in diameter and 10 feet long. During the one winter, I split 5,000 of those rails, 100 of them being a fair day's work, and the price of cutting and splitting them would be 50 cents per 100. In 1842, I contracted the building of a log house for some potters on the Des Moines River 12 miles away from home and was to take my pay in pottery ware. This was rather a new flair in my romantic life, but there was double that that there was in splitting rails. There was a branch of the church at this place called Bonaparte, and many good meetings were held on the Sabbath. I had grown up by this time to be about the age that the prophet Joseph was when he received the plates of the Book of Mormon in my 22nd year. Although not yet full grown and continued to grow until after I was married, and on account of my mother remaining a widow and my two sisters and younger brother and all of us remaining single, I felt inclined to also remain single and keep a home to ourselves until at least my sisters should marry. But our age was such as to incline us to go into company, and we used to enjoy spelling schools, parties, and candy pullings, which was the custom of the country, and we certainly did enjoy ourselves very much. During those times there were several young ladies which attracted my attention. A Mr. William Grimes, not in the church, it came in my way to come in conflict not only with William but also his brother Joseph Grimes. Sometime after the elder one, William, I felt it proper to step in the way and between William and his young lady who was in the church in which I made a success and prevented that union which in after years resulted in her marrying in the church. Soon after, while splitting rails with the Mr. Charles Swayze, he was relating to me regarding the younger brother, Joseph Grimes, intending arrangements with a Miss Nancy A. Porter, who was a young, innocent, and noble young woman. And my friend said, as I had made a success against his elder brother, I would be likely to do so with the younger one, which proved to be true. And those two brothers, after other advances, finally both left the country single-handed as they came as transients. Some years after we casually met at the home of Morris Phelps, where my widowed mother was taking care of the Phelps family, at this meeting of myself and Miss Porter, very strange thoughts were indulged in by each of us, which may appear in future years. 
Before completing the house which I was building for the Potter's family, I had formed some acquaintance with a young lady in the vicinity of Bonaparte and took her to the Nauvoo Conference, October 1840. Sometime after, there were to be some baptisms in the Bonaparte branch, which was to take place in the Des Moines River. This young woman, not being in the church, wished counsel from me regarding her being baptized into the Mormon church. I, of course, thought much of the family, who were highly respected and had a general knowledge of the gospel, and by all means been pleased to see them all join the church and my advice was decidedly in favor of her and all the rest of them, if they truly believed, without any sinister motives, to do so. Consequently, my counsel was by all means to be baptized if she fully believed, but if it was only to please me not to set her feet in the water. I attended her wedding some time afterwards, and subsequently a sister of hers, after they had removed farther up in the territory. When I met the mother of those young ladies, she embraced me, saying, I embrace you as a son, one of the family, just returned home, for you seem to be as such. I remained a few days visiting, talking over olden times, for it so happened that while I was building the house using the broad axe, I severely cut my right ankle just above the ankle very deeply, which was sewed up by a Mr. Welch with a few stitches and salt and sugar applied, which came nearer making me faint than I ever did before in my life. And so strangely is this little narrative that I boarded with this family who nursed me until I recovered. I took a contract to dig a well and cut 200 cords of wood for this same family and also to take pottery ware for this work, or most of it. And while doing this work, I strangely split my left foot, badly severing one of the cords, or the toes, where I was again nursed by the family until I had recovered. Before leaving for my last visit, which was much enjoyed and the last time I ever saw the family, I bore my testimony to them of the truth of the gospel, Tears were indulged in at parting, and I fully believed that they felt sorry that they had not all of them joined the church when they had so good an opportunity. But that chance slipped by, and they had become Catholics. This caused unpleasant feelings of grief for them, for I loved this family as friends, and I felt grieved at their fate. I finally finished the house, received my pay in pottery at wholesale prices, and did well and was blessed in the sales, obtaining flour, pork, honey for 50 cents per gallon, or 12 pounds, got store goods and many things to help make home comfortable and happy, and our way opened up admirably. But we could not help but feel, as though taking up our line of march from our exile from Missouri, that it was coming up through tribulation, Yet in it all there was joy. During those years we were not devoid of our meetings, not only on our Iowa side, but in Nauvoo, where we often went to conferences and general meetings, where we used to feast on the inspired words of the prophet Joseph, his brother, and also as patriarch and the twelve apostles. Our desire was to grow spiritually as well as temporally. The prophet gave rich instructions relative to preaching the gospel by the Spirit and power of the Holy Ghost. Also explained several passages of Scripture. Leave us not in temptation, not lead us into temptation. Near the closing up of the year 1839, Joseph Smith at the White House in Washington, D.C. met the President Martin Van Buren. I heard the prophet after his return from Washington say that the president could weep at church, but said, Gentlemen, your cause is just, but I can do nothing for you, without coming in contact with the whole state of Missouri. Joseph said, We will leave the event with God. He is our judge and the avenger of our wrongs. All of those conferences were grand, all of which I have before alluded to, but this last conference of October 1840 was the largest of them all, 
at which a temple, a house of the Lord, was proposed to be built and a vote taken to commence work immediately. Joseph the prophet explained the law of tithing and baptism for the dead. The Lord gave a revelation accepting the temple site, commanding a temple to be built on the site which was lovely, overlooking the Mississippi River. It was on a hill and in a bend of the river, so that the passengers going up the river could see it for miles as they steamed up and around on the Mississippi River. Although my lot temporarily seemed to be a hard one, but to be permitted to live in such a great day of living prophets and apostles, revelation, inspiration, and to hear such mighty and inspired words of instruction from one in whom I could fancy I could at times in Missouri and other places see mortal man exhibited, in which I, having heard him say that he did not claim perfection but possessed human weaknesses. But said he, when I speak as a man, it is Joseph only that speaks. But when the Lord speaks through me, it is no more Joseph Smith who speaks, but it is God. And let all Israel hear. And here let me bear my testimony that when I have often heard him speak under divine influence, I have felt as though I have been lifted in spirit beyond mortality, and that I was looking upon a God in embryo, and at times found myself in tears of joy. Then, if I was only a fatherless lad and providing a home for a widowed mother, toiling in hard labor, not being permitted to obtain the necessary education as did my elder brothers, and others in better circumstances. Yet I felt a degree of comfort and future hope that God would accept of me and help me as a humble servant to work out an acceptable salvation and to be numbered with such good and godlike men as our prophet and patriarch Hiram Smith, with apostles and others, who I knew feared the Lord as well as to love him. Then to be permitted to attend such conferences and public meetings and to be taught from so high a school of prophets seemed to brace me up with new nerve to return to Iowa and pursue my journey of life even as a peddler of pottery ware, which I had taken as pay for my labor at wholesale prices and had gained by small savings sufficient to buy a lot in Nauvoo and get out a frame of timber to build a house in the city of Joseph called Nauvoo, and this before I was married, besides making and keeping a home for my mother. Hard boyish toil was blessed in very deed by my heavenly Father, and I felt that God would forgive my boyish weakness and snares which not I alone had fallen into, but also many others. Joseph Smith was not without them, and I confess that I never knew anyone without exception who was more ready to confess his human weaknesses than was the great prophet. When I saw the condescension of God and his mercy and long-suffering, tears flowed down my face many times with joy and love to the Lord, and hope that every heart will melt into mellowness who shall learn to love and serve God, repent and do their first works over again when necessary, and walk in the straight and narrow way, which is the law of God in all things. Just before the cornerstone of the Nauvoo Temple was laid, the prophet gave some excellent instructions of translation which I will also record for my children's benefit. He said it was a mistaken idea to suppose that persons translated were taken immediately into the presence of God and into an eternal fullness. Their place of habitation is that of a terrestrial order, a place prepared for ministering angels to many planets who as yet have not entered into so great a fullness as those who are resurrected from the dead. Those translated are delivered from sufferings of the body, but their existence will prolong as to the labors and toils of the ministry before they can enter into so great a rest and glory. April 6, 1841 the cornerstones of the temple were laid with great joy, thanksgiving, and rejoicing. 
The Nauvoo Legion was on parade and two companies from Iowa who were volunteers. Cannons were fired when Brigadier Generals Law and Don Carlos Smith arrived between 7 and 8 o'clock a.m. After 9 a.m., Lieutenant General Joseph Smith with his staff and field officers. It was noon by the time the first cornerstone was laid, the southeast one when President Joseph Smith pronounced the benediction. Thus, this principal cornerstone in representation of the First Presidency is now laid in honor of the great God and may it remain until the whole fabric is completed. And may the same be accomplished speedily that the saints may have a place to worship God and the Son of Man have a place where to lay his head. I was several times from Iowa, a portion of the Legion, as it became necessary to aid in strengthening them in times of mobs, etc., on one occasion, I was elected orderly sergeant at the 70s Hall. The election took place by two candidates being urged out, and then the company formed online with their choice of candidates. The one gaining the most votes was elected. On one occasion, one of the Smiths from Nashville and I were the candidates in which I was elected and entered upon the duties setting guards over the prophet and over our quarters the 70s hall, and we had pleasure in those duties. Perilous times are coming in Nauvoo. Enemies are lurking in an undercurrent against the prophet Joseph. Traitors are working in the dark. I took a job of hauling timbers for a huge log house, and I bought a yoke of steers, and I also chopped and hauled cordwood. I also bought a few sheep and tried to get ahead some. One morning early on my humble little farm, I was binding some wheat while the dew moistened the straw a little, and I gathered up my pile of wheat to bind it into a sheaf or bundle. And when I had gathered up into my arms with the band around it to tie it into a bundle, I was shocked to see a large rattlesnake, all in a coil ready to strike and bite. My hand must only just have missed gathering him up with the bundle of wheat. Only one or maybe two inches lower and my fate and life would have been liable to have been lost. I stood for some time and took a good look at the deadly foe, reflecting upon the narrow escape and could much appreciate and acknowledge the hand of the Lord over me in this narrow escape. And although it is now while I write these lines about 50 years ago, I could see just as I did then, the monster all in a round coil, with his head elevated just a little in the center of the coil, and I could feel the cold chill run through my veins. Many times I see this very vision of the past. The prophet illustrated salvation for the dead by two brothers, both equally intelligent, learned, virtuous, and lovely, walking in all good conscience of righteousness. One dies never having heard the gospel. To the other, the message of salvation is sent. He hears and embraces it, and is made the heir of eternal life. Shall one become a partaker of glory, and the other be consigned to hopeless perdition? Is there no chance for his escape? Sectarianism answers none, none, none. Such an idea is worse than atheism. The truth shall break down and dash in pieces all such bigoted Pharisaism. The sect shall be sifted, the honest in heart brought out, and their priests left in the midst of their corruption. This doctrine presents in a clear light the wisdom and mercy of God in preparing an ordinance for the salvation of the dead, being baptized by proxies, their names being recorded in heaven, and they judged according to deeds done in the body. The prophet further said that those saints who neglect this privilege and duty in behalf of their deceased relatives do it at the peril of their own salvation. Joseph announced that there would be no more baptisms for the dead until the ordinance could be attended to in the font of the Lord's house. For thus saith the Lord, 
The baptismal font was dedicated November 8, 1841 by Joseph Smith. The work was pushed into completion. It was built of pine and a frame built over it temporarily. It was in the basement of the Nauvoo Temple. It was oval shaped, 16 feet long and 12 feet wide, and the basin four feet deep. It stood upon 12 oxen shaped after the best five-year-old steer which could be found. The oxen and ornamental moldings of the font were carved by Elijah Fordham, who I knew in Michigan in 1833-34. On Sunday, May 21st, 1843, I attended a meeting in the temple. The prophet preached and administered the sacrament. The walls of the temple were up only a little above our heads, nearly to the top of the windows at the turning of the arches of the windows. The instructions were very encouraging, and as I have given at different times and will give some of those tidbits and choice items of many of the rich instructions which I have cherished from memory, I will refer unto them as the Spirit brings them to mind while writing. 6 October 1843, First Conference in the Temple. I attended many meetings in the Grove, and at the first two meetings in the Temple, the second being the first conference held in the Temple, October 6, 1843. At this conference, steps were taken to push the Temple to completion. The instructions of the prophet about these times became very instructive regarding the dead, the resurrection, redemption, and restoration of the dead. These meetings were often held in the grove, and I remember one particular meeting held on the east end of the temple in which deep impressions were made which are fresh in my mind as when delivered, because they were rendered by the power of the Holy Ghost. It appeared that the prophet's time was short, and hence his work was crowded. And there is no doubt in my mind, but he at times felt these impressions. For on one occasion while preaching a funeral, he remarked, Some have supposed that Brother Joseph could not die, but this is a mistake. It is true there have been times when I have had the promise of my life to accomplish certain things. But now having accomplished those things, I have not at present any lease of my life. I am as liable to die as other men. 20 March 1842, in the grove west of the temple, at the funeral of Windsor P. Lyons, a merchant's child brought forth excellent remarks. We have again the warning voice sounded in our midst which shows the uncertainty of human life, and in my leisure moments I have meditated upon the subject and ask the question, why it is that infants are taken away from us? The Lord takes many away, even in infancy, that they may escape the envy of man and the sorrows and evils of this present world. They are too pure, too lovely to live on earth. Therefore, if rightly considered, instead of mourning, we have reason to rejoice, as they are delivered from evil and we shall soon have them again. We should take warning and not wait for the deathbed, for it is the will of God that man should repent and serve him in health and in the strength and power of his mind in order to secure his blessings and not wait until he is called to die. As concerning the resurrection, all men will come forth in the grave as they lie down, whether old or young. There will not be added unto their stature one cubit, neither taken from it. All will re be raised by the power of God, having spirit in their bodies and not blood. Children will be enthroned in the presence of God and the Lamb with bodies of the same stature that they had on earth. Having been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, they will there enjoy the fullness of the light, glory, and intelligence which is prepared in the celestial kingdom. On April 10, 1842, Joseph Smith preached in the Grove. He taught the Female Relief Societies on April 28, 1842, how to come in possession of the privileges, blessings, and gifts of the priesthood, and the signs which would follow, healing of the sick, calling out devils, etc., in order to attain unto such blessings a virtuous life 
in conversation with diligence in keeping God's commandments. Those set apart to lay hands on the sick was a correct principle, whether male or female. Through faith the sick may be healed. No evil in what results in good. He had been troubled with elders being unwise in teaching principles, so it would be in this society with aspiring persons. This must be guarded against. Let everyone stand in their proper place and thus be sanctified. You will not have me long to instruct you. The Relief Society should receive keys of the priesthood in connection with their husbands, that the saints whose integrity has been tried and proven faithful might know how to ask the Lord and receive an answer. He exhorted the sisters always to consecrate their faith and prayers for and place confidence in their husbands, whom God has appointed for them to honor. He further said how precious are the souls of men, that the society teach women how to behave towards their husbands, to treat them with mildness and affection. When a man is borne down with trouble, when he is perplexed with care and difficulty, if he can meet a smile instead of an argument or a murmur, if he can meet with mildness, it will calm down his soul and soothe his feelings when his mind is in despair. It needs a solace of affection and kindness. When you go home, never give a cross or unkind word to your husbands. I dare say if he had been talking to the men, he would have talked similar to them. Joseph also said, Don't envy the finery and fleeting show of sinners, for they are in a miserable situation. Edward Stevenson and his seventh wife, Louisa Yates, were the proud parents of three children, two sons and one daughter. Edward Isaac Yates Stevenson was born May 16, 1874 at Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, Utah, and died February 17, 1876 at Salt Lake City and is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Louisa Hannah Yates Stevenson was born May 8, 1876 at Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, Utah, and died November 23, 1877 at Salt Lake City and is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Thomas William Yates Stevenson was born April 12, 1878 at Scipio, Millard County, Utah, and was married January 10, 1900 in the Salt Lake Temple to Anna Louise Hedquist. They had no children. She died August 21, 1900, aged 23 at Forestdale, Salt Lake County, and was buried August 24. Thomas William Yates Stevenson was married June 22, 1903 to Elnora Comfort McKay. They were sealed September 8, 1904 in the Salt Lake Temple. She bore him four children. Elnora died June 18, 1966 at Oakland, Alameda County, California. Thomas William Yates Stevenson was married April 12, 1945 to Gwen Silver. They had no children. Gwen died December 22, 1967 at Long Beach, Los Angeles County, California, and was buried January 3, 1968 in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Thomas William Yates Stevenson died March 16, 1967 at Long Beach, Los Angeles, California, and was buried Tuesday, March 21, 1967 in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Total known posterity of Edward Stevenson and Louisa Yates as of 15 July 1994. Three children, four grandchildren, 11 great-grandchildren, two second great-grandchildren, for a total posterity of 20, with 13 total spouses of children and grandchildren, making a total posterity of 33, including spouses. As descendants of these fine and faithful people, let us remember their strong, wonderful qualities and try to live our lives to make them proud of us.